what happens. So Revelation sometimes is a hard book because people don't like it. Well, God is full of wrath. No, God is dealing with a, all sorts of groups of people. And he's dealing with a group of people beyond just the Jews and the church going home and the martyrs. He's also dealing with people who will not repent. Right. But the judgments that he's pouring out are not really against people. They're against the earth that is unredeemed. He's dealing with a fallen world and a fallen earth. Sin went into the earth. Yeah. And it's a, it's a fallen planet. He's also dealing with governments and kingdoms and regimes. He's also dealing with an enemy because Satan's desire in Revelation is to set up his own Godhead. His own Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is exactly his desire. It's to imitate. That's what the Antichrist is and the false prophet and the one world money system and the one world government and the one world everything and worship and the one world church. It's all to set up his own kingdom. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, my kingdom isn't of this world, it's in the hearts of men. Come on. Yeah. So we have to understand that revelation is not all about us. Because actually if we're serving the Lord and we're one of those virgins that have our lanterns lit, ready to go and full of oil, right. we should be here. We're not mentioned until later on in heaven. So, um, and actually we're mentioned in Revelation 7 because you see the bride. John recognizes the bride. Yes. So I'm just doing that as a review because if you weren't here last week, you need to know where we're at. So as a review, the seven seals, Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. The, the seals, which is like more like a big scroll, where as you undo one seal, then the next one shows up. Right. And I've shown that. Um, as he begins to open up the seals, he's the only one worthy. This is, um, and I mentioned this Sunday, he's the only one worthy because he gave his life. Okay? He's, he's the perfect Lamb of God. He's the one worthy. The other thing that's really interesting about this is he's also the one who made it. He's the one who made this seal, this scroll of seals. And so not only did it come from him, it was stolen because he had given, this is the rights that he had given to Adam over the earth. And when Adam sinned, he basically handed that over to Satan. And to redeem it, Jesus had to give his life to get it back when he got it back. Not only though is he worthy to open it because he redeemed it with his own blood, he's the only one worthy to open it because he made it. Do you notice Satan can't open it? Right. Even though he stole it, he can't open it. Because it didn't come from him. So that is very interesting to see. So um, the first seal is broken and we see the white horse. And we've talked about this. I'm just kind of generalizing it just to bring us back. Um, and the second seal is open. We see the red horse. Then the black one. Then the pale horse. All of these horses run simultaneously. And actually, and Pastor Daniel showed us this, if you look at war and famine, and disease, and death, and conquering, and all of these things in order, you'll see that these things follow each other in procession. They just do. So, number five, the fifth, soul, the fifth um, seal was broken in the souls. You saw the souls underneath the altar slain for the word of God and their testimony. In the sixth soul, seal was broken and a great earthquake happened and the sun goes black and the moon turns to blood and the stars fall and heaven rolls up like a scroll every island and mountain moves and we see the 144,000 Jews are sealed we see a picture in the sixth seal of the bride the martyred saints and the sealed Jews now we are on the seventh seal so if you turn to Revelation 8 We're going to read through this, and then I'm going to go through it. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all his saints, 
upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came from the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire from the altar and cast it into, cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. I want to stop right there. We're going to go into the seven trumpets in a minute. I don't want, I don't want to go too far. Because I want to talk about the silence in heaven. And what this is talking about. There is silence in heaven for about a half hour. Now this was interesting to me because... If you go into the understanding that he is in heaven seeing this, and so how does he know time? How does he have any sense of time? Is he talking human time or heaven's time? Because here's the question there, okay? In human time, a half hour is 30 minutes, but in heaven's time, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. So this concept of a half hour, I believe he's talking literal. And I believe the reason why he's talking literal is because he even mentioned time at all. You don't see him mention time any other time here at all. Even though we talked about if all the other seals are opening in sequence, you're looking in about a three-month span. John doesn't mention that, though. That's just how you're looking at it lined up in a seven-year span, how everything would fall, it would be about every three months seeing something. But John specifically here mentions this time frame. So obviously he had a concept of a half hour. And I don't think he was talking heavenly time. Because a half hour in heaven, what would that mean on earth? It could be all sorts of things. It could be really fast and it could be really slow. And so because there's only a seven year span, I think he was talking literal. And so the more I kept looking that up, I thought, I think he's talking literal. But what happens in silence? So I was looking at the rest of the scriptures and I was thinking, where was God ever silent? Oh, lots. And why would God, why would all of heaven stop for silence? Why? What does silence usually mean in a storm? Have you ever been through a storm? And you're in the middle of the eye of the storm and it gets really quiet. 